All right, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 2, then we're going to be flipping over uh, to Ephesians chapter 2 as well. Uh, You can find all of that on the uh, Bible notes, uh, on the Bible app, sermon notes. That's a lot of Jesus words in one. Um, Hey, so uh, we are in week three of a sermon series called What on Earth Am I Here For? We're we're taking a hard look at who God has created us to be, uh, looking deep down inside of not only ourselves, but the Word of God to see who has God uh, made us to be, who has He created us to be. And so uh, for me, this has gotten a long journey of uh, both who I am and who I'm not, things that I'm good at, things I'm not good at, things that I know uh, and things that I don't understand. So tonight, I, I want to confess to you that there is uh, something that I just do not understand, no matter how hard I've tried to understand uh, this thing. I can't understand it. That thing that I don't understand uh, is England, okay? England. Uh, and even when I say England, I don't even know if that's the right thing to say, right? Because I don't know if it's England. I don't know if it's the United Kingdom. I don't know if it's Britain. I don't know if it's Great Britain. Is that when it does good things? It's called Great Britain. I don't even know what to call it. I don't understand why you put milk in tea. Uh, that just seems weird to me. I'm still not sure what a crumpet is. Uh, I don't understand why they have to add like the U and the O-U-R when it's just O-R. Maybe it's just my red-blooded Americanness that I choose ignorance over England. I, I just don't get it. I don't understand the humor. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I have finished going through uh, the American Office series and I finally decide, yeah, I'm going to try this British one. I've watched the first 10 minutes of the first episode like 10 times. Don't get it. Don't understand it. And then we, we go into the government uh, of England. And maybe you're one of those people who love like the crown and stuff or any, or any of y'all, those Netflix people other than my wife um, and Zach. That's <laughs> shameful, man. Um, but, but then there's this whole other side of England and their government. I don't get it, right? Because there's a queen. There's not a king, right? Right now? There's no king right now. There's a queen, but the queen has no real power, right? So instead, they have a prime minister, and then they have uh, the parliament, and then they have uh, houses, and then they have ministers for everything. Now, let me say, uh, I think that they're using that word wrong. Right, because when I think of a bunch of ministers together running a government, that's just terrifying. Like, that's just a bad idea, yo. We don't get numbers. We don't understand that. Our brains don't work like that. So to have all of these ministers running the government sounds pretty weird. They have a lot of different uh, ministers. Have you ever watched the parliament debates? It's the most passive-aggressive British thing I've ever seen. They're screaming at each other, but you call each other sir and madam. Right? You're, you're really nice to the people while you're screaming at them. It's bizarre. But they have these ministers for everything. They have a, a minister of agriculture, fisheries, and food. They, they have this, this need of, of feeding people, and so there's a minister to look over that need. Uh, there's a minister for transport. They know people have to get from one place to another. There's a minister for employment. They know that people have to work, and so they put a, a minister over that need. They have one for international development, how to talk together as a community of people on this planet. Um, But back in January, uh, Prime Minister Theresa May uh, appointed a new minister. You see, from what I can tell, the ministers address some sort of need, food, transport, shelter, work. And back in January, Prime Minister Theresa May appointed a minister of loneliness, a minister of of loneliness. She said that this minister of loneliness would address the, quote, sad reality of modern life that many people live in loneliness. There was such a great need for people to be connected and people not being connected that an entire governmental position was created to address the issue of loneliness. My, My guess here is that everyone here in this room tonight has experienced loneliness at some point. Uh, Maybe you moved to a new city and you didn't know anyone. Maybe you moved off to college and you didn't have any friends yet. Maybe you were given a new job or you lost your job and, and your community that you once had was then gone. You experienced loneliness. Now, we all go through seasons of that at some point of our lives, but this loneliness that this minister is addressing is not just specifically for those people in transitional moments of life where we're, trans, trans, we're going through to, from one community to another, from one place to another, from one stage of life to another. It's not that sort of loneliness. It's a bigger loneliness problem. 
The statistics say this. Uh, a Cigna study was done of 20,000 adults. And they found that 54% of respondents said that they feel like no one actually knows them. 56% of respondents said that the people they surround themselves with are, quote, not necessarily with them. I suspect that's just people uh, with uh, parents of teenagers who have cell phones. 40%, 40% of people said they lack companionship, their relationships aren't meaningful, and they feel isolated from others. About one in every two persons said, I experienced some chronic loneliness in my life. And this is, not, uh, this is a relatively new phenomenon in human history, but it's been something that sociologists and, and psychologists have observed for quite some time now. Back in the 90s, a man by the name of Robert Putnam coined the phrase social capital. And what Putnam, who's a professor at Harvard, observed is that social capital has been steadily on the decline for the past few decades. He defined social capital like this, features of social life, networks, norms, and trust that enable participants, people, to act together more effectively to pursue shared objectives. Features of social life like networks, norms, and trust that enable participants to act together to more effectively pursue shared objectives. Putnam talks about how the, the bowling leagues are completely disappearing. That once people will join up with other teams and go out and bowl on a Tuesday night, how those are disappearing. If we look at, at attendance and membership in things like the Lions Club, Rotary Club, Junior League, even church attendance, he observes, has all steadily been on the decline for the past few decades. This loneliness phenomenon we are now reacting to, that even though we are more connected than ever, we are more isolated than ever. Even though we have more ways to communicate with one another than ever before, we don't communicate. It led England to appoint a minister of loneliness because the studies will show that it's not just a, 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 a mental problem. It's not just the feelings that happen in loneliness. And when I say loneliness, I, I'm not talking about staying at home on a Friday night with your cat and watching Gilmore Girls, right? I understand that some people are naturally introverted and that you get energy from being alone. That's who God has created you to be. There is certainly absolutely nothing wrong with that. What there is something wrong with is that more and more people feel unable to connect with one another. It's creating emotional difficulties, but it's also creating physical difficulties. New studies have shown that, that this feeling of loneliness, this feeling of being alone, has linked loneliness and social isolation to heart disease, cancer, depression, diabetes, and suicide. Uh, Vivek Murthy, who was once the U.S. Surgeon General, has written that loneliness and social isolation are, quote, associated with a reduction in lifespan similar to that caused by smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's not just an emotional problem that loneliness causes. It causes our bodies to actually break down. And so what sociologists will say is that throughout human history, people naturally gravitate towards one another with similar affinity, similar interests. But now for some reason in our modern world, we're drifting apart. And so what I want to show you from the word of God tonight is that we were meant to be with one another. That this loneliness that people are experiencing is not natural for us. It's not living out our purpose. That's why it's against not only our emotional well-being, but also our physical well-being. What I want to show you tonight is that you were formed for God's family. You were created for community. You were not designed to live life alone, but to live it with a group of people. And to do that, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 2. So we've been in Genesis uh, the past couple of weeks, we've touched on it, because I think it's important that when we talk about our purpose, we go back to the very beginning of all human history, that we don't just start with when we were born, but when we look at our, our origin story, who God has created, not just me and you to be, but humankind to be. And so we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. It says this, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work Keep that in mind and to keep it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for on that day you eat it, you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. So this is the first and only time in the entire creation narrative where God describes something as not good. Right? He creates the heavens and the earth. He says that they're good. He creates water and land, says that they are good. Creates animals and plants, even things like mosquitoes for some reason. And he says, it is good. But then God looks out at Adam and sees that he is alone. It's the only time he says, it is not good. So notice back in verse 14, Adam is doing something. We know that in the garden, God has given the authority and the sovereignty to the man to work the ground and to keep it. He's got a job. He's got a career. He's on an upward path because he's the only person on the face of the planet, so chances are he will end up as CEO. But he's working the ground. He's tending the land, and yet still God looks at him and observes that it is not good. So many people try to find their meaning, try to find their purpose, try to find what their life is all about in their work. They say, if I can just put in the hours, if I can just climb the ladder, if I can just get to that bracket that I want to be in, if I can just study hard enough to get the job that I want, then I will be happy. But even at the start, at the very first man who is working actively, God looks and says, this is not enough. This is not good. He keeps going. Uh, The Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make for him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them into the man to see what he, the man, would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Here's another temptation that we have as modern people. We have the temptation not just to find our meaning and our purpose based on our work, but the second temptation is power. It's power. We we want to climb to the top. We want to be presidents. We want to be CEOs. We want to be counselors in our organizations. We want the power over people. And yet here we see Adam has more power than perhaps any man has ever had. And yet God still says, this is not good. If you're one of those people that you have that inclination, that kind of desire, that drive to become more powerful, I I hope that you'll take some time to evaluate that. Because there's certainly nothing wrong with having influence, with having power, with having people that work under you, that that what you say matters in your work, in your home, in your organizations, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But if our drive for power is out of a drive for purpose, it's a drive of pride. If our drive for power is a drive for purpose, is a drive for pride. It's not to make much of God or our organization or our company. For many of us, it's a drive to make much of ourselves. God looks down. He has given Adam power. He's given him a job. He's giving him prestige. Yet it is still not good. Verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept... The Lord took one of his ribs, and he closed it up in its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken the man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is the bone of my bone. He says, I've been longing for this. In the flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of the man. Now, the temptation in preaching this passage is to immediately talk about marriage, right? If you've heard Genesis 2, that's often the context that we put it in because the very next phrase there, the very next verses, talks about that, that that a man should leave his mother and a woman shall leave her parents and they shall become one. And yes, this passage is about marriage, but it's about something much deeper than that as well. It's not just about companionship. It's not just about procreation. It's not just about fighting who gets the Netflix remote. It's about something deeper than that. It's about our deep need and how we were created to be with other people. We were created for community. We were formed to be children of God together. We were formed for God's family. Because what we're told just a few uh, chapters before, one chapter before, is that man and woman are made in the image of God. The fancy churchy word for that is the imago Dei. 
We're made in the image of God. And that always sounded weird to me because I thought, that, does that mean a God is, you know, a, a scrawny 5'10 guy with arms and legs and brown hair? And the answer is no. Right? We're made in the image of God, not because God looks like us physically, but because we're made out of the same stuff that God has made out of. That he has created us to be image bearers of him, like him. And what does that mean? Our God is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, existing eternally and co-equally together in perfect harmony and perfect relationship. Father, Son, Holy Spirit in relationship with one another. What that means is that when God created us in his image in the Imago Dei, we have in our DNA and the stuff that we are made out of a desire and a longing to be in relationship. And the way God has formed us, there's really two primary relationships that should orient all of our lives. The first is a relationship with God. Because he has created us, he has given us a purpose, he has given us of himself, and so our desire should be a relationship with him, but not only a relationship with God, a relationship with one another. We're made in the image of God who is perfectly in harmony, in community, so that's the same stuff we're made out of. We should love one another, and we should love God. But in the passage we just read, we get a foreshadowing that something's about to go terribly wrong. There's one tree they can't eat from, one stinking tree. And yet out of a desire to not worship God, but to worship themselves, Adam and Eve eat of this tree, and that fractures the cosmos. From then on in Genesis 3, everything else is broken. And so the great story of our Bible is God's redemption plan for us, to restore us back to that place of perfect relationship with him and perfect relationship with each other. But because sin has entered into the world, we have a problem. Our relationship with God is fractured. They used to walk through the garden and commune with God, and now they don't. They used to live as people in perfect harmony with one another, but what do their children do? One kills the other one. You may have bad kids, your kids aren't that bad. Sin fractures the relationships that God has created us to be in. So then the rest of the story is his great redemption plan, his great rescue plan, bringing us back into him. In the post-fall world that is marred and broken and fractured by sin, our relationship with God and our relationship with one another are not over, but they're just more difficult. Because what sin, the first sin, tells us is that we think of ourselves more than we think of others. We want to make ourselves into little gods instead of worshiping the one true God. In the New Testament, we see what God's great redemption plan is for our relationship with one another, and it's called church. It's called church. That God is building up a people from all nations, from all races, who don't have to be born into a certain family or born into a certain demographic or born into a certain skin color. That God is raising us all up into his people called church, that we might have true community and fellowship with one another. Yesterday, I got a chance to go to uh, an open house over at uh, the Mending Hearts Grief Center. Uh, So the Mending Hearts Grief Center is a ministry of this church led by uh, Dr. Tommy Myrick. I love to call him doctor because he is a doctor. And um, it's it's a ministry to the community, a free ministry. Every night of the week, they have groups who meet there to talk through grief. And, And grief comes in all forms. It comes in the loss of a person, of a loved one, of a friend. It comes in the loss of a relationship, in a divorce. It comes with the loss of, of our animals. There's a pet support group because pet grief is real. Every night of the week, there's people that meet there. And so I went to this open house because I was told that there would be free uh, breakfast tacos. And if you want to get me anywhere, offer free breakfast tacos. And so I go, uh, and I'm getting a tour of of their facilities over there by Walmart. And I was told a story uh, by a woman named Liz. And and it was a story that Tommy had told us the day before. Uh, One of the big programs that they do there is grief uh, counseling and grief uh, groups for children who have lost uh, parents or grandparents who are close to them or, or, or close loved ones. And so this, this group would meet, and, and the, the parents would show up, and they split their kids off into age-appropriate rooms, and the parents go off to go learn what the kids are learning so they can help them process through their grief. 
And, and the, the, there was a group uh, that, uh, of children, of younger children, uh, kindergarten through second, I think. And then there was a group of, of high schoolers that were meeting that night. And uh, both of those groups of the kids got out before the parents did. And so in the little lobby area, the kids were kind of mingling and, and, and talking to one another and waiting for their parents to come out. And there was a little uh, five-year-old boy who um, was there. And the, the whole night, he had been pretty rambunctious. He didn't really want to talk uh, about his feelings because not many five-year-olds want to. And so he had kind of been running around and just sort of wild. And, and there was a, a high school girl there as well. And, and the high school girl had come out of hers, and, and they had done an art project. And uh, one of the, I think one of the, the counselors there said, hey, why don't you tell this little boy about your art project? And so she does, and she says, I, I built this, I, I painted this because it, it reminds me of my father who died. And Liz said at that moment, the boy's face lit up. And he said, your dad died? My dad died too. He realized in this moment that he was not alone. He realized that even though he felt like he was the only one experiencing what he was experiencing, he was not. He felt a true connection, and that started a friendship. C.S. Lewis, because it's not a sermon without a C.S. Lewis quote, put it this way. He said, friendship, true friendship, is when someone says, to another, what? You too? I thought that no one but myself. Fill in the blank. What? You too? I thought that no one but myself. He says that's when friendship is made. And that's what God is doing in the church. Paul writes about it in Ephesians 2. He says this in verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, two words that mean alone. You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. In him you are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Holy Spirit. This is one image we see of the church throughout the scriptures, is that the church is being built as a people into a temple for the Spirit. And one thing, I I don't know much about England, I don't know much about building, but what I do know is you can't build a structure with just one brick. You can't build a structure with just one brick. So if we as the people of God truly want to be the people of God on mission for him, we have to be in community with one another. And the reality is that in our modern era, I'm a little bit scared about the direction of many Christians. Because if we're honest, what I'm seeing more and more is that the the vast expanse of internet media online means that people aren't going to church. Self-described Christians would much rather stay home, turn on a a live stream, or turn on a sermon from a way better preacher than me. They say, why why go see Daniel when I can listen to Matt Chandler, or, or Stephen Furtick, or Francis Chan, or fill in the blank. And so what's happening is because such great content is readily available on our hands, we would rather stay home. We'd rather consume than contribute. The church is not just about consumption. It's not just about showing up, being uplifted in a sermon or not uplifted in a sermon, singing a couple songs and going on your way. That's not what the church is meant to be. You can't build a house with just one brick. You can't encompass the Holy Spirit with just one person. It's a community. It's a family. We are all children of God meant to be together. Because here's the deal. The the statistics on loneliness are scary. They're terrifying. But the fact that the English government has to appoint a minister of loneliness to me says that once again, the church is punting on our responsibility to be the minister of loneliness. All the social problems of this world should not be kicked up to Washington, D.C. We need to handle them here. 
And for us, that means being invitational. That means not just being in the pew. That means not sitting at home. That means getting into the fight because that's what it is. Not just against flesh and against bone, but against spiritual powers that are drawing and ripping people away from our communities and isolating them where their emotions and their physical well-being are at stake. In church, we cannot stand for that. We are to be the minister of loneliness. Because remember I said back in the garden something fractured, something was broken. Our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. But what happens is that Jesus, God in the flesh, comes to live and dwell among us, to be one of us, to experience what we experience and to draw us into his family. That relationship that was once broken is now restored in the Christ. And then when, the, when Christ leaves, he says, I'm building something and I'm sending you something. I'm building a church and I'm sending my spirit. And he said, that spirit is gonna unite you together just as I and the Father are one. He prays in John 17, may they be one. May they be united. May they be a community. May they be a family. May they be in fellowship with one another. So if you're lonely tonight, my guess is that you're missing one of those two relationships. We can be surrounded by people and yet still miss the relationship of the one who is calling out to us and reaching out to us in his love and in his grace. We can be surrounded by people all the time and still miss the most important relationship that our souls need with the one who loves us, who redeemed us, who died to save us. At the same time, we can have that love in us and that relationship and still feel alone. And if that's you, my encouragement is get in the fight. We do that in lots of ways. We get dirty together. We build things together. We go on mission together. We join together in circles. We sing songs together. We show up early to church sometimes. We stay late from church sometimes. We fellowship with one another. We do things that people have always done. We eat, we sing, we gather, we play. All of that is designed by God for that purpose in our life to be formed by God's family, to be created, to be a community. Let's pray.